Hello everyone, my name is Matthew Wittall. Uh, I work at Kennedy Space Center's Deep Space Logistics and Swamp Works. I'm Sean Butts. I work at the Kennedy Space Center Gateway Deep Space Logistics Project Office. Thank you for coming to our talk. Uh, our presentation is on system level model based risk determination for lunar mission design. So since Apollo, we have spent a lot of time studying lunar dust and getting a better understanding of how that distributes over the lunar surface, both in the immediate vicinity of the landing or impact and across the entire lunar surface. There's ongoing work to better understand the amount, quantities, and size distribution, but given recent work, we've been able to establish a rough mathematical model for different aspects of lunar dust trajectory modeling. So with this recent understanding, we are able to model these particles as they travel across the lunar surface. And from both simulation and experimental evidence, we know that some of this dust can land anywhere on the lunar surface, not just in the local vicinity. High velocity particles can even go so fast as to affect objects in orbit. So in this project, what we're trying to do is model the lunar system as a whole. We've divided things into two categories. Either it's an event, such as an impact event on the lunar surface or a landing in the South Pole or elsewhere, or an asset, such as a rover, a base, a satellite, or the gateway. When we first set out with this project, no generalized mathematical model existed for interaction between any given asset and event on the lunar surface or in cislunar space. So with that in mind, we had three objectives with this project. First is to develop a mathematical model that can generalize exactly that, how an event on the surface can affect anything else on the lunar surface or in orbit. And once we had that generalized mathematical model, then we want to make it more accessible to systems engineers and mission designers by integrating it with model-based systems engineering tools. Finally, we want to be able to use this tool to estimate lifetime risk of an asset on the surface. So if you're designing a mission to the moon, then you will be able to run this tool and gain an understanding of how many impacts you can expect from lunar dust, how much energy those impacts have, and how it can affect the design of your spacecraft. In order to implement generalized mathematical methodology, we have to have some base assumptions to make this a little bit easier because for some problems, there simply is no mathematical solution yet, especially the more complex it becomes when you include things like solar wind or non-spherical properties of different astronomical bodies. So the first assumption is that the asset is stationary, which may not be the most accurate assumption when something's in orbit. However, the differential velocity between the slowest dust particle and the fastest dust particle, considering our constraints, isn't that much when you take into consideration the velocity of the spacecraft in general. So most of these particles are gonna hit during a very short period of time. And so stepping your spacecraft through a time-based integration isn't necessarily that important. The second is that the asset is close to the moon. Some previous work showed that when you're at Apollon, in the case of gateways near rectilinear halo orbit, the dust concentration is very low, regardless of what the event is. Most of it is carried away by solar wind or things like that. Third, events are binary in nature, which means it's either an impact or it's a landing. And these physics are a little bit different. I'll talk about that more in a minute. But in both cases, the constraints of the dust is between one and three degrees from the horizontal. We're also assuming the moon is spherical, so we're not considering topographical features on the surface of the moon. So hills, uh, craters, things like that. And finally, space is black, empty, and boring, meaning there's no solar radiation pressure, no other bodies. It's just the moon and the dynamics in its immediate vicinity. All right, so the first part of our mathematical model is the impact ejecta model. Most of this is based off of Hausen and Holes Apple's work in 2006, which shows this formula. There's a lot of different variables here, but basically it can be simplified into two categories. Either you have some of these variables describing the impactor, such as a meteor or an upper stage of a rocket, and some of these properties that describe the lunar surface itself. Some of them are constants, such as this nu and mu, which become important later. The physics of an impact and landing event are distinct, so the next part of this considers the physics of a landing event and how much dust is generated and ejected from a landing plume. So for this, we're using this approximation based on experimental evidence generated by Metzger in 2016. Now by plugging this in and using this as the total mass ejected, then we can scale it based on velocity and get a mass distribution above a given velocity, which is our final equation at the bottom. So basically what this comes down to is, here's the equation we used for an impactor and here's the equation we used for a landing. Note they both use the same exponential mu and nu, which describes the surface of the moon. Looking back to this figure, what we have is an event on the surface and an asset either in orbit or somewhere else on the surface. So we need to generalize the interactions between these two things. First of all, we have the position vectors of both our asset and our event, and we know what direction the dust is going to depart from our event. 
However, what we don't know is the velocity magnitude from the event that will cause it to intersect our asset, and we don't know the velocity magnitude at intersection with that asset, and that's important for determining with how much energy these particles are going to hit our asset. And finally, we need to know that impact angle. All right, so now that we know what we have and what we need, we need to come up with three equations to solve for our three unknowns. The first equation is conservation of energy by using the Vsvo equation. Uh, since we know that the energy of this particle is going to be the same at departure and intersection with our asset, we can equate these two points. So position one and velocity one to position two and velocity. We can arrange this so that you have velocity two in terms of velocity one or vice versa. Second, we use conservation of angular momentum, which you see here. By equating angular momentum at one point to the other, we can also generate this equation. Now, what we don't know still is theta two. So in order to solve this, we turn to equations of an ellipse. So if we equate this MA major axis at one point to the other, and we know the angular difference between our first position and our second position, then we can make some substitutions. However, this doesn't solve all of our problems. In this eccentricity equation, we had to add this term in in order to capture the dynamics caused by that change in flight path angle. In other words, the angle at which the dust departs the surface relative to the horizontal. Now, as a note here, this is making the approximation that true anomaly is roughly equivalent to this flight path angle at the surface. And this only really works for small angle approximations, which is why we didn't consider large angles for our impactor. Although more impact ejecta is generated at higher angle. All right, so now that we have all these pieces, the final part we need to consider is the particle size distribution. And for this, we use Metzger's work from 2020, the equations shown here. This is important because we need to know how big the particles are that are hitting your spacecraft. There's a big difference between being hit from a one centimeter particle and a ton of one micron particles, for example. In this normalization constant, R min and R max are the minimum and maximum particle sizes considered for any arbitrary distribution. And now to talk about the model-based systems engineering approach, uh, I'm going to hand it off to my colleague, Sean Butts. So now that Matt has completed all the mathematical modeling necessary to model all these phenomena, the next step was to figure out how to convert and incorporate all of his work into a SysML-based MBSE model in the Magic Draw software. First and foremost was a representation of all of the mathematical equations into SysML constraint blocks. Those SysML constraint blocks, or our parametrics, were then utilized by two different types of analyses uh, models that we created. We created an impact model and we created a landing model. The reasons for this were purely for ease of use in the modeling software. Um, in the future efforts, we hope to incorporate both events into one generalized type of event. A landing event and an impact event both utilizes lunar surface properties as a part property as well. In future revisions of our modeling, we hope to incorporate landing or impact location-specific representations of the lunar surface properties, but for now, we've simplified it to say that one set of lunar surface properties apply to any type of event. In the bottom image on this slide, you can see our entire analysis model. On the left, on the top, we have the asset, and then below that, the event, and the data from the event and the asset flow through the equations to develop, on the right-hand side, um, our final analytical results, which are the particle bins, we call them. So once we have our model constructed, we can then start developing instance collections that represent the different types of analyses that we want to perform. Once we had the instance collections complete, we then developed a simulation configuration, the green block shown on the left here, each of which lets us easily and quickly run through a given simulation or a given analysis. After the simulation is run, the data is exported into an instance table within MagicDraw, which is then easily exported into Excel for further data reduction or analysis. So that's exactly what we did. We generated a 15-year analysis for the Gateway spacecraft, a 10-year analysis for a low lunar orbit satellite, and a six-year analysis for a, a notional south pole base. Each of these assets had a different cross-sectional area, which we just measured in a linear sense, so a diameter, uh, 4.3, 45, and 100 meters respectively. So for a nominal Artemis timeline, we kind of get what we expect. Gateway isn't affected very much, while a south pole base, which is much closer to the frequent landings of Artemis, it gets a lot of impacts, 284.3 of them, which that 0.3 in this case isn't just counts, it's a percentage as well. So that's a 30% chance of uh, having 285 impacts, for example. Uh, the relative speed of the dust and the low lunar orbiting satellite results in, in a higher mean energy for these particles that impact, uh, while lower mean energy is experienced for surface assets that aren't moving, such as Apollo 11 and the South Pole base. So using these tools, we can also experiment with some abnormal situations for the purposes of contingency planning, such as a Chang'e lander very close to the Apollo 11 heritage site, 
or maybe an upper stage impact. Module disposals from the gateway during off normal situations could impact the north or south pole, or maybe a meteorite impact of moderate size, say 100 kilograms, hitting the lunar surface at about 20 kilometers per second, which is about the approximate velocity you would expect that to occur at. Some of these, such as the meteorite impact, aren't much to worry about based on the analysis given here. However, other situations, such as a module impact very close to the lunar south pole base, would be a cause for concern. So what this work shows is that there's essentially no safe place to be on the moon when there's any surface activity occurring, either natural or man-made. However, there are some things that can be done to mitigate the fallout from these events, such as building a landing pad, using advantageous topography to shield some of the subjecta, especially in landing events, or if you can't do that, then minimize your cross-sectional area by forming uh, certain maneuvers to shield sensitive instruments from oncoming dust and debris. And the design of your lander could actually matter quite a bit too. If there are ways of designing landers that reduce the amount of ejecta generated for each landing event, it will greatly reduce the risk to other surface assets or assets in orbit. So in terms of future work, there are some refinements we can do to the mathematical model, making it more robust and more generalized for different events. We can include non-spherical terms for the bodies. We can include multi-body dynamics, solar radiation pressure. All these things play into how many small particle impacts you have on your asset, even on the other side of the moon. In addition to any changes to the mathematics or the physics that are used to model this phenomenon, we'd also like to make some changes to the SysML based model that we generated itself. Uh, for instance, there are several areas that we could optimize it to allow it to model multiple assets in multiple events to make it easier and more user friendly for the systems modeler to run analyses or generate instances for analyses based on different criteria or different uh, phenomena that are of interest to the team. We'd also like to eliminate any dependency on MATLAB, which is critical to the current instantiation. Um, and that would require some optimization of the code that we use to, to represent the physics and the mathematics. Thank you very much for listening to our talk. If you have any questions, we'll be happy to answer them in the comment section in the web interface or during our Q&A session. Thank you.